Welcome to Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living. And also by this station and other public television stations. And now your host, science correspondent, Ira Clayton. Welcome again to Newton's Apple. If you marvel at science and technology, if you wonder about nature or the human body, if you're just curious about the world around you, that's what we're here for, to answer your questions. So let's get right to our first question. And today it comes from Los Angeles, California. When my family and I go to the mountains during the winter and we're sitting in front of the fireplace watching it crackle away, we wonder what is fire? Actually, we've received many questions about fire. Fire is something that people use every day, but often don't understand. Well, here to answer some of your questions is Randy Lawson of the Center for Fire Research at the National Bureau of Standards. Welcome to the program, Randy. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Let's get right into the question about fire. Very mysterious. What is fire? What is burning all about? Well, let's answer this question. What does this apple and this <laughs> have in common. Wow, wow, that's hot, that's not... <laughs> well, that's true. Really? Okay, but uh, what we're looking at here is what they have in common is oxidation reactions. Mm -hmm. This apple is undergoing an oxidation reaction that's slow. You mean that's what the brown part is? That's what the brown part is, just like rust on steel. Mm -hmm. That's an oxidation reaction as well. So the apple's combining with oxygen and creating that little color there. And that's so it's right. like the apple is rusting then. That's right. Now, what and does that have to do with flame, though? Okay, with this flash paper, we had an oxidation reaction that was very fast. This okay. is a slow oxidation reaction. So burning is a very quick oxidation reaction. That's right. And there are three basic things you need for burning. Mm -hmm. Fuel vapor, right. oxygen, and heat. Mm -hmm. When you say fuel vapor, now I didn't see the candle being, a you know, as it burns there, it doesn't appear to me to have any vapor in it. Okay, well, let's take a look at this over here. Would you light this, this candle for me, please? All right. What are you going to do for us here? Okay, this is Tim Worth, our professional firefighter, and he brought a container that has a piece of cloth that has gasoline on it, which will oh. produce vapors. Oh, gasoline has the natural vapors that come off of it. That's right. Now, I'm going to open the slide, and we'll step back because this is very dramatic. What's going on here? The vapors are pouring down that trough. You don't see them. Towards... Oh, now yeah, you do. <laughs> wow. And the vapors hit the flame at the bottom, ignited, and mm -hmm. caused the flame to rush back up to the source. Mm -hmm. This is the reason that you don't want to be using liquid fuels in an area where you may get another ignition. So it's not the fuel itself that's igniting, it's the vapor from the that's fuel. That's right, and gasoline will vaporize as low as 45 degrees below zero. Wow, wait, now I can understand how gasoline, which has a natural vapor to it, could be ignited into a flame, but I don't understand how you can get wood or oil or other hard or harder substances to give off a vapor and ignite. Well, what you have to do is heat them up. Let's okay. take a look. All right. If you had Light this burner for me, please. All right. Okay, we're cooking. Pick this up and hold it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick this torch to this and try to ignite this piece of wood. It's not burning. <laughs> it doesn't burn. And the reason for that is the great mass of the wood carries the heat away from that point and doesn't allow it to get up to the right temperature to create the vapors. Mm -hmm. Now, if you pick up that splint and stick it up there, Oh, yeah. You see, it ignites very easily. Yes. Because it has a low mass. Well, I, I believe this. I've seen this happen in my own fireplace. But you're still not explaining where it's not going out, where the vapors are. I don't see any vapors coming okay, off. Okay, of well, it. let's take a look at this over here. Okay, what's going on here? In this particular flask, we have the same types of wood chips. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is heating the wood chips and we're producing the vapors that will ignite. Oh, yeah? Coming out of the top of the vapor? Coming out of the top. They're, if you, they're not burning. The chips are not burning in there. That's right. They're not. Uh, if you'd pick up that match and hold it to the top of the flask... All right. 
Oh, look You'll at that. You'll see that it really burns. Wow, Those it really are the vapors. Does. Wow, we. Is this the kind of vapors? Uh, wow, I'm just, I'm just uh, ogling at this. Now, I understand that the vapors are burning, but I don't understand why they're burning. Okay, as the, the vapors are developed, they're heated and they have the molecules in the vapor has a greater chance for collisions with o oxygen molecules, oh. and therefore you have the oxidation reaction. And a rapid oxidation reaction. That's right, which produces Agreed. a fire. And that burning flame in perfect combustion will produce CO2 and water. Well, actually, those should be the, the products of, of the flame. Well, what, anything else in that flame? I mean, just CO2 in and water? In this particular flame, it's not burning perfectly. Therefore, mm -hmm. it would produce other materials that would be pollutants. Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of fire I would have in my house? Would this be going on in my furniture? And Something things? similar to this can actually happen in your house. Mm -hmm. And I have some videotape here that will show you that. All right, let's go look at that right now. Ooh. Okay, this is a uh, fire test that we ran at the National Bureau of Standards that shows a room that you would normally have just like you would have in your own home. It's furnished with furniture exactly like you would have. The wall finishes are similar, mm -hmm. and you've got drapes on the wall. But would I have a fire on my couch and the newspaper like that? Well, that newspaper was ignited by a match, but it could also happen with a cigarette. I see. Boy, and that is moving quickly for a fire like It sure that. is, and this is real time. Mm -hmm. uh, the flames on that couch will spread to the wall and to the curtains, as you'll see in a moment. How long will this, will this take? Uh, Less than two minutes. So it's not even enough time for me to go outside, yell for help, and come back? Absolutely not. If a fire like this developed in your house, you would want to get outside and call the fire department. Wow, look at that. Yes, I, I can see it's really spreading quickly. Now, as the fire develops here, you would see uh, a cloud develop in the upper part of the room. Is that the vapor that's being given off by the... Uh... Well, those are vapors, and, and it's a gas cloud mm -hmm. that's located there that gets very hot, up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Gee whiz. And when it reaches that point, a very unusual thing happens with the fire. It's a point that's called flashover. What's that? The flashover is where that hot gas cloud mm -hmm. produces thermal radiation which causes vapors to come out of the floor and the materials underneath the gas cloud and then ignite. And I you'll see, see that happen Real right vapor now. Vapor story. Get there the vapor. Look, look at that. Thermal radiation caused Just that. the heat from the gas on top, not That's the flame right. jumping anywhere. Exactly. It's just surprising how fast that fire spread. You think that was fast? Take a look at this. Well, you have a metal canister here. You got a candle lit inside. That's right. And we have flour inside. Yeah, spread all around. And what, what is this? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to create a dust explosion. Like in a green elevator. Light it, like in a green elevator. What's what, the principle behind this? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put a top on this, mm -hmm. and uh, we will introduce air in there that will disperse the dust, mm -hmm. cause the dust to come in contact with the flame. The flame will vaporize the little dust particles, mm -hmm. they'll ignite, and we'll have a Build up in pressure and an explosion. All right. Well, don't don't try this at home. We're going to stand back here, right? This could right. be pretty this dangerous. Is, this this can be dangerous. You definitely wouldn't want to do this or any of these other experiments at home. Whoa! Wee. Wow! Is everybody all right? Yeah. Gee whiz, that was a lot of fire in there. That was really dramatic. Well, you study fire for a living. Well, what kind of fire research are you involved in? Okay, now? what we do is we try to study fire to understand it so that we can better predict how it's going to behave so that we can save lives. Well, thank you, Randy, for coming and sharing your knowledge about fire and for presenting us with a really fiery explanation. We'll be right back. They get their rosy color from the algae they eat, which contains a natural pigment called keratin. In captivity, they're fed carrots to keep them in the pink. It takes a fair amount of energy to fill this three-gallon bucket from an old hand pump like this. How long do you think it would take to pump three or four thousand gallons? Well, that's about what an adult heart does every single day. 
We get many questions about the heart, how it works, and especially how scientists have developed the artificial heart. Well, here to answer some of these questions, I'd like you to meet one of the surgeons who implanted the first total artificial heart in Barney Clark. Please meet Dr. Lyle Joyce from the Minnesota Thoracic Group. Welcome to the program, Dr. Joyce. Thank you, Ira. What is the artificial heart? Before we talk about the total artificial heart, let's talk for a few minutes about the normal human heart. Ira, let's pretend that you're a red blood cell coming back from the body <laughs> through the right atrium into the right ventricle where we are standing now. Beautiful heart you have here. Right. As you can see, we've got a blue color here because you've lost your oxygen to the mm -hmm. tissues. And now the right ventricle is going to pump you out through the pulmonary valve, out through the pulmonary artery, into the lungs. All right. I'll give it a and try. Out in the lungs, you're going to pick up some more oxygen where you'll take on a red color and come back through the left atrium, the mitral valve, and then into the left ventricle. Wonderful one-way valves over there. That's right. It'll allow the blood only to go in one direction. Now the left ventricle is going to pump you out to the rest of the body through the aorta. Seems like a wonderfully ingeniously simple device. Why is it so much trouble to make an artificial version of this? The concept is simple, but there are many problems that we've had to face in trying to duplicate mm -hmm. what the good Lord made mm -hmm. in the normal human heart. Let's talk about a few of those. First all right. of all, let's look at the heart-lung machine, which was one of the first developments in allowing us to perform open-heart surgery. This is the heart-lung machine here, which is used to sustain life wow. during op open-heart surgery uh, procedures. The system consists of roller head pumps that take the blood from the body through these tubes and pump it around through an oxygenator and then back to the body so that the heart and lungs can be stopped mm -hmm. during the open heart procedure. Well, why don't you just then shrink this up into a smaller version and make an artificial heart that way? There are problems with the design of this unit that make it more traumatic to the red cells. Mm -hmm. It's good for a few hours. It'll sustain life for a few hours, but it cannot sustain life for days to weeks or indefinitely, as we expect in a total artificial heart. Let me show you the total artificial heart now and the changes that we've made in order to overcome some of these problems. Wow, that's it? This is the Jarvik 7, the total artificial heart, identical mm. to the one that Dr. Clark had implanted. Now, describe it for us. What are we looking well, at? It consists of two ventricles mm. put together that can be set in the chest right in, this, like uh, in this fashion. On the underside, you can see two inflow valves and two outflow valves. Mm. Each of these are tilting disc valves. Oh, yeah, they just bounce like that. Look right, that allow the blood to go only in one direction. Now, uh, compare it to our, our human heart. We have a real human heart here. And tell us how it compares. OK, if we put the two side by side, I think you can appreciate the fact that there's very little difference in yeah, size yeah. between the normal human and the Jarvik 7. Now, when you could, we perform the operation to, re, to put this in a human, what do you do to this heart? We excise only the pumping chambers, only mm -hmm. the ventricles, by cutting right down this line here, I see. removing this portion, and then sewing this heart to the remaining remnants of the heart. OK, now how do you get it to pump? OK, the pumping action is performed by compressed air. If we look at this cutaway version of a single ventricle and let you be the air compressor, <laughs> okay. by blowing air in and out of that tube, we can watch the diaphragm. It's like the heartbeat. That's right. And when you suck the air out, the blood is brought in through this inflow valve. And when you pump air in and move the diaphragm up, oh, look at the that. blood is pumped out through the outflow valve. So this would take the place of the beat. Then. That's right. Very simple, yet effective, right? Exactly. This doesn't mash up the red blood cells like the heart-lung machine The surface does. on this is very smooth. It's a polyurethane, which causes very little reaction Now, of course, if we have uh, the air hose here, you have to have a large compressor to drive it. And that's what we've seen Barney Clark hooked up to. That's right. This is the Utah heart driver here, and it is pretty bulky. It's about the size of a wheelchair and about as portable as a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. If you had a total artificial heart, your home would be equipped with a central compressor system, pretty much like our central vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. systems today, such that this unit could be moved. You could move this unit to room to room, and by automatically unplugging the cord from the wall, Air in these compressed oh, tank systems and batteries in the unit could keep you going until you got to the next room and then could plug the cord and the air hose back into the wall in that room. But I'm still limited to the house. I can't get out of the house that way. That's right. It would be tough to get on the golf course <laughs> with that sort of a <laughs> setup. Which I would like to do if I had that. Ideally, we must have a totally implantable unit. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to that, though. Oh, really? In fact, the Hymus driver has been perfected to the point 
Let's pretend, for, for example, that you have a total artificial heart. This is your skin. These are the air hoses coming right. out, of the, out of the skin here. Right.